Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Morning, everyone. I hope you are having a fabulous week. I just got back from a bit of a splash in the uh, harbour just down near our house and it is freezing, but it is nowhere near as cold as what it is down in Dunedin where my mate Ash and his mate Cody go down to the water in St. Clair every morning before dawn for a bit of cold thermogenesis, which is just bloody amazing if you ask me. So anyway, this week I am so stoked to bring to you this conversation that I had with Lola Berry. Now, Lola is a nutritionist, yogi, author, entrepreneur, and just this all-round awesome Aussie chick. And we talk about life, business, goals, and everything else in between. And look, she's so really, so well known in the nutrition space. But she's so much more than that and she's evolved so much over time that I really wanted to chat to Lola about what really drives her ambitions and, you know, what she's got in the future. Lola has a Bachelor of Health Science that she completed at Endeavour College of Natural Health where she majored in nutritional medicine. She's the author of a number of best-selling books including Inspiring Ingredients, The 2020 Diet, The 2020 Diet Cookbook, Lola Berry's Little Book of Smoothies and Juices, The Happy Cookbook, The Happy Life, and she does have another book that is being released in September this year. In addition to all of the above, she co-founded a successful smoothie bar before launching Lola Coffee, which is a mix of specialty instant coffee and lion's mane, and she was generous enough to send some over to me after our conversation, which was awesome and I absolutely love it. And for the last couple of years, Lola's love of acting and presenting has had her honing in on further developing these skills in order to further herself in this space as well. And this is something that she absolutely truly loves. And if that's not enough, she's just surpassed 100 episodes of Fearlessly Failing with Lola Berry, which is an interview podcast about failures with guests that include some of the best known Aussie actors and personalities, all about how failure has then subsequently led to some successful outcome and just changed paths in their lives for the better. So Lola and I, as I said, we talk all about kind of how she's evolved over time and it's just an awesome conversation. You can clearly tell that I'm a big fan and I think after our conversation, you will be too. So here's my chat with Lola Berry. Lola Berry, kia ora. how are you? Thanks. I am good. I am happy to be here. I'm happy we made this happen and I'm honoured to be on your podcast. I've had a little stalk, you know. Oh, oh my gosh. Do you know, know, I've heard you talk on your podcast about how you can get intimidated by like interviewing some of your guests. Mate, this is how I've been feeling like for about four days. And the song that has gone through my head is that Lola. Hello, LA, which is obviously completely different because you're not a man dressed up as a woman or anything true. like that. This is but true. Um, it is funny your name, um, not your name, your name is lovely, but the legacy of your name because past relationships, sometimes we end up with a t shirt. I got a Lord of the Rings DVD set. Oh, that's good. That's I, a good score. It is, but you got Lola Berry. Yeah, it did come from a day. So my real name is, people listening, is Lauren Smith quite boring no offense to any Lauren Smiths out there but my first ever boyfriend was like my si- my sister's name is Lauren can I please call you Lola <laughs> and it just stuck and I feel like I'm much more of a Lola and we were just saying before we hit record <laughs> I was telling Mickey I was like oh I called myself Lauren as I was getting angry at myself which I usually don't do so I must be seriously angry at myself to call myself <laughs> Lauren I mean my dad does that I was just going to ask actually that usually because my name's Michaela, but I have been Mickey since forever, since as soon as I was born. But I only get Michaela from um, this 
woman who was my supervisor at the supermarket who hated me and my mother when she was angry so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm feeling you I'm feeling you yeah so Lola like I have written so many notes on what we could talk about because of course you have done so much entrepreneur you're an author you're a nutritionist you are the former owner of happy place and now the current co-owner of Lola coffee you do acting school you're a yogi how do you fit it all in in your 35 years? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do you get like when people kind of list out what you've done, do you kind of stop and go, mate, that's a bit? Well, when you said happy place, I'd almost forgotten because like I loved, I loved every bit of happy place. But uh, when I let go of something, I let go of something. So I'd almost gone, oh, oh yeah, I did do that thing, which took up a big chunk of my time. Like it was a huge part of my life for three years. But, yeah, I think I'm a big believer in my meditation teacher said you follow the charm, but in yoga we say you follow your dharma, your purpose. So I always believe in kind of like following that kind of river and I know that's why my career changes so much because I really like to follow that kind of passion, you know. Yeah, it's interesting you say your career changes because it's so grounded in health and your passion for health just comes through through your Instagram where you seem to just and I know it's not right you know you don't live your life on Instagram but you know a large part of your appeal is that you share so much on Instagram and and this is what we love about you and it's not just me who is sort of similar slightly older the younger age group like one of my besties is close to 60 and I said oh I'm interviewing Lola Berry today and she's like oh I love Lola Uh, you know uh, Tell me, Lola, can I take me back? How did, like, a young Aussie girl end up on US TV doing cooking, food-related stuff? How does that even work? Oh, well, that's my dream. I love, you've listed two things I love straight off the bat, Mickey, and that is I love filming. It's like my number one thing. If you said you'd lose, I could take everything away from you, the smoothie bar, the coffee, the yogs, the nutrition. I just love filming. Like time stops me when I'm on set. Time stops me, whether it be acting, whether it be TV hosting, whether it be making a chocolate mousse recipe, I don't mind. I just love the medium of filming. That's when time really, really stops. Uh, And then America, I love doing filming in America. So the two for me are so entwined in what I love most of all but to put that all into perspective for you that's probably like two percent of what you do filming (laughs) yeah yeah so you've got to have other things that fill your cup and um make you feel good and make you feel really um connected to what you are doing I don't know what the question was because I've gone off on such a tangent. No, no, it's so (laughs) fun because I was doing a little bit of um, kind of background reading on kind of how you sort of started and I heard about you on, I think it was the Wellness Couch and you were interviewed from, I want to say it was Chris, someone, Damien Christoph. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen him for yonks years. I hope he's going well. I haven't seen him for yonks. He used to be on TV here um, for some kind of wellness kind of show and this was pre paleo if you like 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 when it kind of popularized they were about two or three years before that so everyone sort of looked at it like this is awesome a little bit freaky because where are those grains so he was talking to you and you were just kind of talking through I think one of your first books and I think he was talking to you about the 2020 diet which wasn't your first book but it was earlier on yeah totally so you were an earlier adopter of what seemed for, for to me of the paleo approach, that real holistic approach to nutrition. How did it discover you, Lola? You're going to laugh that I just answer it this way, Mickey. I was literally, I was just saying to you before this, I was at the naturopath earlier because I've got a blocked ear getting um, ear candles and I bought myself some paleo hot cross buns, didn't I, while I was there. <laughs> so you've, you've just, um, <laughs> yeah, it's just funny, that's where my brain went as you were asking that. Um, yeah, so I kind of, yeah, I started on that kind of like paleo- paleolithic style of eating probably early 20s because I was always, when I'd be on TV, I was always a little bit heavier and I was kind of referred to as the foodie girl as opposed to the nutritionist. Mm. And I just hadn't figured out my body. Like I hadn't figured out that I'm allergic to a lot of things or intolerant to a lot of things. And, you know, I'd eat really healthy and nutrient dense, but it'd be like spelt or, you know, I'd still have a lot of gluten in my diet, diet, even though they were whole grains. And so 
going paleo meant that I naturally cut out all these things that caused inflammation in my body. Mm. And so that's why it works so well for me. And like weight loss just became a byproduct of feeling great, of high energy, of good sleep, of clear vision, of happiness. And so I kind of just adopted it because it felt so aligned to my way of living. And I actually found it really easy to adopt because I was working and living in America for a little period of time there. And they were like, I remember it was really big to wear the Vibram shoes, you know, like the toe shoe. Yes, it was all that kind of movement when I was in America and Hawaii. And so it was so easy to eat like a grain-free diet or, um, you know, go out and you just get massive in America, you get massive chopped salads and they're full of so much good stuff. And so I think I came back and and I'd really adopted that way of eating and I'd lost a bunch of weight too. So that's where the 2020 diet book kind of came around about how I'd lost 20 kilos as well. Mm, mm, Interesting. And then back here, were you, did you find yourself ahead of the curve and were people kind of like, what's this girl on about? Or were were people generally kind of aware and kind of jumping on board this whole idea? Can you remember? Yeah, so when I came back, I got that book deal straight away and then A Current Affair, so that's our big news show in Australia, ran a story about how I'd lost all this weight and then that then the book came out kind of thing. And so everyone kind of was jumping on the wagon and very happy to talk about it because, you know, as women we often struggle with our weight at certain stages of our health and well-being kind of journey. So it, it most people were pretty pro I didn't get any negative feedback other than like I took it too far like and I did I also had an eating disorder at certain phases and it would trigger when I was stressed out mm. and sort of kind of come back and I just control even though what I was eating was really really healthy I would just control portions too much yeah and so um I did take it a little bit too far then um and and throughout my life I have too I've dipped into taking it too far and I've dipped into going too far the other way but um yeah, I, I had a very positive response from the paleo diet. And obviously, like Damien, who you're just referring to, he was really lovely and supportive because I think because he had had that media career in New Zealand, he came here with this confidence. And so anytime he interviewed me, I felt very comfortable around him. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah and nice. And, I mean, you have been sort of in the public eye from a young age, you know, from that kind of, um, and probably earlier, but, you know, if I'm thinking kind of in your early 20s and stuff and have had to steel yourself against, or, or at least um, have that confidence outfacing because you, you're always going to get people with their opinions on you, you know, how you look, what you wear, what you say, what you promote. And I did read in another article that someone criticised you and called, said you were a disgrace to the nutrition industry because of what you wore like yeah Lola how oh did, yeah how did you kind of grow in confidence and stuff with comments like that I mean for someone who you know when you when I see you on Instagram you are so open and you you seem to wear your heart on your sleeve and it can't be easy to have those kind of criticisms and stuff particularly early on I mean I, I imagine it's quite different now yeah totally so you've hit the nail on the head with the age thing first of all so um, I was 23 when I started in morning TV and I was 23 when that comment was said. I'm 35 now, so she could say that to me now and I'd be like, ha, you need to go to a therapist, mate. But like <laughs> at that time I was like, oh, my God, this person hates me. I am a disgrace. But th- just to give context to that story, I was working at a smoothie bar in between uh, like I do one segment a week on TV and then I'd work at a smoothie bar and then I'd take consults. They had a clinic room out the back. So I was working as a nutritionist making smoothies at a like fancy grocery store basically in Melbourne and um, this nutritionist came in and I really looked up to her because she was like in Melbourne one of the leaders of you know nutrition and I've been to her cooking demos at events and whatnot and I was like oh you're so and so I'm a huge fan and I was like full fangirling over her and she literally looked at me and she was like I know you and I was like no 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 we've never met I'm just fangirling you right now. I think you're awesome. And she's like, well, it's a really hard degree. Like it's a really hard degree to turn into a career. And I said, yeah, I I understand that. I'm really enjoying it though. And she goes, you're that girl off morning TV. And I said, yeah. And she said, you are a disgrace to the nutrition industry. And I said, "Uh, I appreciate your feedback. I'll pass that on. And she goes, I'm entitled to my opinion. And I said, totally. And she said, how can anybody take you seriously by the way that you dress, 
right? And there were five oh people God. lined up for their smoothies. And I remember I just made those smoothies in silence. And as soon as they um, were out of the shop, I locked the door, ran out the back, bawled my eyes out. And then um, I was like, I can take this on. I can believe what this chick's saying. She's clearly having a bad day and taking it out on me. Or I can, you know, just let it go. And I let it go. But I think now if someone said that to me, I'd probably, um, because I've got a little bit more self-worth now than I did then, I'd probably say, why do you feel that? As Mm. opposed to just like going, okay, I'm sorry you feel that way. Like and I was really kind of like trying to calm her down. Um, But I did see her many years later and she's nice as pie to me. Yeah. Did she ever apologise? I don't think she would ever remember that conversation. Yeah. Isn't that interesting, eh? Like when people say things to you that they really cut you to the core, yet and, and there's something then there are certain things that you just would never really forget. And I don't know whether you I mean, you may well have forgotten that comment. I just and then I just of course reminded you of it. But you know, if you oh, kind of think fine. back to like parts in your life and you're like, Yeah, actually that one person said that one thing, but to them, like it would have been just another day. Totally, but I mean that's what that's why I like to talk about it because I think if someone in their early twenties hears this, they might be mm-hmm. like, "Oh, that might just be a dingo." Like this, a, dingo is my word for dickhead, a bad person. Yeah, you can bleep the other word I just said. But di- di- yeah, dingo if someone that's a bit of an idiot or a drongo or not nice. And knowing that now, like, um, I'm hoping that like a twenty-something might hear that and go, "Yeah, like that person was just." taking their unprocessed stuff out on me. And I know I'm speaking like I've been in therapy and I have. I've been consistently in therapy for four years now and, yeah, now I, would, I wouldn't allow that behaviour to happen to me. Um, I'd hold space to hear why they felt that way, <laughs> but yeah. that would be as far as it goes. Yeah, yeah, and I think what you describe is really something that would have to be practised and and like you say, you've been in therapy and you're really open about that. And Lola, you're really open about a lot of things, right? Like your eating disorder, like I've heard you talk about that a number of times, and your therapy, and it's so good that people and, and women particularly have people like you to look up to and can kind of go, you know, you're kind of normalizing a lot of what people go through and experience and make them feel okay and make them feel their shame and that kind of thing. So I feel like that's one of the reasons why you're probably as popular as you are. That means a lot to me. I want to say, like, thank you so much for saying that because for me, like, I'd rather be real and like warts and all and that help people or that maybe inspire people to get help. Like, and that's why I'm so open about having a therapist because it's been, I know that I'll look back and having a therapist will be the reason why I was able to move forward in my career and move forward in my personal life and stop dating narcissists, you know, and all (laughs) these kind of things, you know. So I'm very, very pro, pro therapy. Yeah, that's awesome. And like I was saying at the start of the call, you've done so much. And so, you know, it takes a certain personality to continue to drive forward the way that you do what I didn't mention was of course your podcast fearlessly failing which is fabulous and I love the name of it how have the things that you've done Lola kind of progressed you forward how have you managed to kind of put all of these things together look I've got to give the credit to the podcast of the podcast to my boyfriend my wonderful boyfriend who just walked in (laughs) um he he's a music producer and now podcast producer <laughs> and editor and he's been amazing and integral at making that dream come to life. I'd always wanted to do a podcast, well, for a year before it even existed. And as you know, it's a lot of work, like it's a lot of behind the scenes and like it sounds like the moment I started talking to you, I could see how much prep you'd done because I do the same amount of prep. I'm about eight hours per guest mm. and it's – rare that someone does that much prep (laughs) you will um, start to realize as you consume podcasts and there's nothing wrong with that it's just different styles but like I take it so seriously and I've got a trip to Sydney next week and I've got four guests and they're all authors and I've got four books I've got to consume and read in that time and my brain is like ah how am I (laughs) how am I going to do this but yeah I just think as far as how they all propel each other and happen and everything happens pretty organically but also like I'm not gonna lie to you like it takes hard work it takes Mm. like hours you have to get those hours down and uh, like the acting like that took 
hours of stuffing up and extra classes and I was getting extra dialect shoots. Like it's not just like, oh, learn your lines and away you go and you're going to be the next, you know, Hemsworth star or whoever you think you're mm. going to be. Like it, it, you've got to you've got to apply yourself to anything in life, I think. Yeah. And, you know, someone might look at you and go, mate, you are living the dream in Bangalore, you know, near Byron Bay. Are you living your dream? Like is where you are now where you thought you might be or did you just kind of have that organic, I'm just going to see where this takes me? So it's funny. A lot of people say to me, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you must be like wrapped and your career yeah. and everything. And I'm like, mate, I'm not a hundredth of where I want to be with my career. I'm grateful for where I'm at. I freaking love everything that I do. I do it with all of my heart. I don't give up. I work hard. But I know what my dreams are. I know what my aspirations are. And, and I'm not close to them yet. Like I want to act. I want a TV host. I want to, um, like I tell people, I want to be like the Jimmy Fallon. Like I'd, I'd love to have a variety talk show. And people are like, well, you're not a comedian. You're not a journal. You don't have that backbone of training. And I'm like, no, but I've got my acting training. I'm trained TV presenter. I've got my nutrition. Like I've just got a different like arsenal of skill sets, you know, so. And you're quite I, funny. I mean, you know. Oh, like, stop it. Yeah, stop it. Really keep, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Like I, I love, like I love Australian self-deprecating humour. I love yeah. it. My fave, I think the smartest uh, comedian out there, and this is quite polarising to say, but I love Ricky Gervais. And oh, I yeah. Just, his brain. Amazing, and, and, eh? Anytime I'm, I'll email you after this, but anytime I'm having a bad day, because I get a little bit, fearful of my age sometimes when I see all my friends having kids and getting mm. married and whatnot and my boyfriend and I both don't know if that's the path that we want to go down and people like well you better freeze your eggs then and there's a lot of pressure and a lot of Instagram pressure like I, you, until I called it out I was getting a lot of people writing to me going why aren't you married How, are you gonna freeze your eggs you're 35 oh, da 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 and then I told everyone to piss off <laughs> and like that's our private information, you know, like yeah, yeah. I, it really upset me. So I just was like this is something that we're choosing to um, to focus on career and then whatever happens after that's whatever happens after that. But um, I don't know where I was going with that. I feel like I keep going on tangents with you. Mickey. No, that, that's totally fine. <laughs> we were talking about Ricky Gervais and what I will oh, say amazing. is his Humanities, I think it was, his last – uh, comedy segment on Netflix, amazing, so so good. In Afterlife, he does. oh god, uh, did you cry every episode? Oh yes, it was amazing. Yeah, oh, yeah. gives me goosebumps now. But he, the way he, so there's a really great interview. I'm going to email you after this, and he got won his first BAFTA, which is like a British yeah. film award, at uh, 41 years old. Oh wow! And he was sitting on the couch with his partner, his life partner. I think her name's Jane. And he's and he was holding the BAFTA and he goes, Why did I wait so long? Because I think he won it for office or yeah, extra, yeah. I think it was office. And she said, You couldn't get here without your life experience oh, that totally. got you here. Right. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, I got goosebumps and I was like, Of course. Like, I'm not meant to become a TV host until I've got life experience, you know? Like yeah, I, yeah. you know, I just think we'd like my neck, the book that I've just finished writing is like nothing about recipes. It's all about mental health and celebrating failure. I couldn't have written that without all this other, all this other stuff that I've been through. So yeah, I kind of trust a little bit more in the journey now. Yeah, nice. And I was actually going to ask you about your book because I went searching to try and figure out what it was about, but I either I missed any story that you had about what it was about or you haven't really said a lot about it, but maybe you have and I've probably just completely missed it, but it is very close to being ready. End of the year, is it? Yeah, good, great research. Um, September, it's a September release, so I think it's a September 28 release. So yeah, it, it's much more. Um, it's it's almost think self help personal memoir. Yeah, yeah. Nice. No images inside. No, like we shot the cover last week. Yeah, and it's just a cover. I think it's just my mug, and then um, nothing inside. Just just it's like a, to read it will be like a novel, and it's like life lessons, stuff that's helped me, um, stuff I've learned about life, heartbreak, you name it. Su yeah. success, failure. You yeah, know, the work. Was it hard to write? No, it wasn't. Uh, I wrote it in lockdown. We were in a really strict lockdown in Victoria last mm. year. 
and we were living in Torquay, so the surf coast of Victoria, and I signed the deal just as we went into second lockdown, which was the really long lockdown. Yeah. And so I just wrote my little brains out and I think I delivered like the day before I moved to Byron. So I delivered like the end of November. So, yeah, I just like made up my mission to just write and write and write and it was easy. It, it was easy to share because I think I'm at a stage in my life where I'm ready to share. If yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And, you know, writing is, it's hard grind, isn't it? Like it really is discipline to get up and go write and just today I'm going to spend four hours or three hours and that is what I'm going to focus on. It's so easy to get distracted when you write. Oh, Mickey, show notes. Oh, my show notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got to write something tonight and I'm like, here we go. Here we go. Show and is, notes. Is Matt like telling you, Lola, you've got to do that intro and outro and you need to do those show notes? You're like, yeah, 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 I'll do it. I'll yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. And it's podcasting a- is. Podcasting is cool because you can do it on the fly and you're going to have this okay thing or you can give it your all yeah. and it, you can feel like I can even feel the momentum behind fearlessly failing and I'm like, oh, this has got legs. You can feel because yeah. you're putting stuff because I do a Friday episode where I just kind of check in and there's yeah. no prep to it. I just share the day in the life. I still do show notes for it, but I just i am talking about life in Byron Bay and it's fun, but it also feels like I haven't prepared it like yeah. to do it feels very it's a different format whereas the guests like I'm so like you like I've got everything ready to go I've deep dived I know what um I want to ask these guests and I know how I want to like I think you, it's such a beautiful respect to have really researched a guest because mm. it feels like I know now <laughs> if I'm ever in New Zealand I'm gonna be like Mickey yo can we hang like I just think it just it's the coolest thing when you Respect your guests. Yeah. Oh, I'm going on that tangent. But, oh, yeah. no, nah, no, nah, I totally hear you. And it's funny you say that about Byron Diaries because I love them and people love them. And I think part of it is, Lola, is that people love you and they love sharing your life as you do on Instagram, right? So if there's another opportunity, and God, this sounds like such a stalker, but when you've got those little snippets of life in, on, in Byron Bay and you're just on there and you can actually almost hear that you're like, oh, no, now I'm just waffling on. You're not. Let's just say you're not because people love to hear it. Um, and actually, Tourism Australia need to kind of, you need to check in with them and get them to check out because <laughs> that's great. But, you know, it's just a complete share and that's what people love about it. Yeah, well, I love it as well because my life takes me to different places and it's about to take me to a different place uh, in the world later in the year. And I, so a part of me is like, I want a little honest check in because mm. I get scared and I, or I go through something or, like I've just been all last week at a health retreat in Byron Bay and like I'm like I want to share that because not everyone can get there it's like a really beautiful you know exclusive luxurious retreat so I'm like oh and so like I had all my before I this one I did prepare for prepare for because I recorded it today and um, I had all my notes of like the retreat and everything I'd done because I was like, I'd want to know this. Like, oh, yeah. I'd want to listen to that, me personally. Oh, no, totally same. And when you mentioned Gaia Retreat and then I Googled it and looked at like the packages and stuff, I'm like, mate, that looks awesome. And the thing with you, Lola, is obviously like an influencer like you, you get given a lot of things, you know, like people will send you lots of like beautiful things. But every time I see you open the package on Instagram, you are so genuinely excited to receive a gift and you can really see that you know some people in your position they almost expect to be given stuff and don't really give it the meaning that maybe you know it deserves all the respect I suppose it deserves but you're authentic and did you know Lola I'm a bit of a geek and uh, there was a study that came out in Nature Communication last year which is quite a good journal Mm -hmm. saying that people that share themselves authentically on social media um, have a much more positive mood, a much more positive sense of self. And it's actually just so much better for you to do that rather than to portray something that you're not. And I yeah. thought of you when I read that. It's just easier to be real. Oh, as well. mate, like, yeah. In, in, keeping up the facade is just too much. I'd rather just be real and be like, sup? Like, I don't know. I just think I would rather be real and not liked than be... Uh, fake and have weird people like me but also on the influencer gifting stuff I do sometimes get some backlash for getting sent stuff I'm now since moving to Byron I've decided to become much more 
selective with what I say yes to gifting mm. only because we live in a tiny home yeah, behind yeah. me is we've got a little picture on our couch I'm like sitting on the floor in the lounge room it's um small and I'm like I just don't want clutter and this is our first space that we've got together and mm. I just don't want to other than books like I don't want to collect too much so yeah, yeah I've become a lot more selective so that means when I do get sent stuff I'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice um obviously with coronavirus everyone's life sort of took a bit of a turn you know yeah. like the travel that everyone had planned got credited for air flights and basically everything kind of turned on its head and you were about to go to America. Correct. Yeah, you have done your research, my friend. Uh, yes, I was meant to go and activate my green card, which I've worked three years to get and spent 30 grand on. Right. <laughs> I had three flights booked over Corona, like when it was the hardcore mm. you know, lockdown for Victoria uh, and they all got cancelled. So I've pushed it out as long as humanly possible, but I'll have to go in a couple of months. I'll have to head over there, which I'm absolutely shitting myself about I'm so nervous like I am living this Byron dream right now I'm in this Mm. bubble where COVID doesn't exist to be honest like the only time it exists is when I go to Ballon airport and they take my temperature and my mask goes on Mm. but everything else here is so easy and it is so free of corona Mm. Um, and to know that I'm going into the fire (laughs) yeah in America is is petrifying but at the same time like a green card is a 10-year residency, so Mm. I'm not willing to lose it. Well, particularly in light of what you see in your future with your acting and with the potential to host and just gain that experience and stuff, it almost feels like that's the place that you should be for that. It's the mecca. And America, you look at history and the entertainment industry, like after World War II was the golden era, you know, of Hollywood. And so you watch they'll go through this and they'll be hit really hard, but I believe the other side of that Americans are evangelists. They're so excitable, they're passionate, they're driven. The other side of that will be so much potential and so much opportunity and it's just about sticking it out, I yeah. think. Yeah, totally. And so like America changed to Torquay, which mm-hmm. like so different in terms of just the, the vibe and the energy and there's almost two sides to you, Lola. There's that really stimulated, energized kind of, I'm going to say type A. I don't know that you yeah. are a, pu- a pure type A, but, oh. you know. But then <laughs> there is that real kind of chill, kind of happy. You've described yourself as a bogan before and as someone from New Zealand down south, I can relate to that. How was it in <laughs> Torquay? Did you appreciate that time? Yeah, we couldn't have had a better lockdown. Like Victoria got hit so hard with lockdown Mm. in Australia and Melbourne especially, and we were out of Melbourne. Like I didn't go back to Melbourne once. I remember um, my America flight got cancelled on like middle of March and Dad's like, take a weekend bag, just go down to the Torquay Beach House. No one's renting it. He had it on Airbnb, like for holiday stays and stuff. No one was in it. And he goes, just take it, go down there. And my boyfriend met me down there and I was like, I'm staying until I know what the F is going on. And I didn't leave for 10 months. Wow. So it was so wonderful. Like it was nourishing. It was a slow pace to the point that Matt was like, because we were looking for ages for a place in Byron Bay. It's really hard market to get into Mm. at the moment. And he was like, if we don't get Byron, we should rent in talks, which is my word for talkie. And yeah. I was like, no, we've done talkie. And then this place came up. And so, yeah, Byron feels like an extension of talkie in that it's just like um, a more famous person's area of bit. Like we've we've seen it, Hemsworth, we've yes. you know, had our – had our little run-ins. My favourite is Simon Baker. I was just going to say, yeah, I heard you saw him. Amazing. So handsome. He yes. goes to our local cafe and he is just a dreamboat. Like I'll always <laughs> be like that stalker, like having my coffee, like actually you'll love this. I never, ever talk about um, people coming up to me kind of stories because I just yeah, think, yeah. oh, whatever, they're mates. But these two women came up to me, my boyfriend, we were sitting at Woods and they were like, oh, my God, I've just got to say I'm a huge fan. I think you're great da, 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 and saying the loveliest things to me and then they're like you know Simon Baker's over there we're too nervous to go up to him 
because, you know, he's so famous, but you we don't care about. <laughs> I was like, thanks, girls. Thanks. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> it was like the most sweetest backhanded, like, kind of yeah. compliment. I was like, yeah. But I was like, I don't blame you. He's such a dreamboat. Yeah, so, he's sort yeah. of like Australians answer, Australia's answer to, like, George Clooney almost, oh, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's younger, handsome. but still handsome. And he will silver oh. fox it very soon, if not already. Oh, yeah, no, dreamy. He's got that, like, brooding look about him. But Matt, my boyfriend, we were in Uri Bar, which is a uh, suburb just outside of, like, Bangalore, and he parked. It's really hard to get parks because, like, it's overpopulated at the moment. And um, we got this park and this really tall guy was walking towards us and then a guy that just was, like, normal height. And I looked up and I started, like, you know, when you're banging someone on their leg, like, I was like, that's Liam Hemsworth, that's Liam Hemsworth, boss, that's Liam. And he's like, far out, Lola, I've just parked him in. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, I've just parked him in. And I'm like, well, move the car, move the car quick. He's literally like two metres away. I'm mortified. So I'm just looking at the ground at this stage. Like I just pretended I had something in my bag and I just looked at the ground. Matt, meanwhile, opens his door. He's like, oh, get a mate. Sorry, I think I might have <laughs> parked you in a little bit. And good old Liam's like, nah, man, you're all right, because they've both got four-wheel drives, Matt and um, Liam. So two big cars kind of parked in. So like, nah, mate, you're all right. Now Matt's like, oh, me and my mate Liam. Oh, you would be, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, that is awesome, really. I couldn't make eye contact. I had just looked down at the ground. <laughs> I was that starstruck. I was just looking down. <gasps> oh, lovely. <laughs> um, so, Lola, I said before, I mean, obviously, you know, you're a yogi, you're quite happy, you talk about crystals, you talk about the moon, and I read somewhere that your nana taught you how to read tarot cards when you were like 15. Is that spiritual kind of mystical side of you? Is that from your family or is it something that you've developed? Where did that come from? So Nan has always been like that. My Nan passed away during lockdown and I got all her tarot cards and I usually wear her ring around my neck as well. She's a very, very cool human being. But she, she taught me how to read tarot cards. I haven't kept it up though. So mm. um, I've got the decks with me and sometimes I'll – like one or two cards and like just do a mini reading but as far as like crystals and energy healing and all of that I think I'm trying to think where it came from like at Happy Place to Smoothie Bar I had like a 30 kilo clear quartz crystal as soon as you walked in and we had clear quartz in the ground and everyone that bought a smoothie got a little crystal given to them so I've always loved the crystal stuff. I did, when I lived on the Goldie many years ago when I was studying my nutrition, so I would have been like 21, I remember I studied crystal healing like I did a proper course in it. So I I think I've just always been slightly hippie, but like like as my lovely agent Lauren would say, She's like, you're hippie sheep, Lola. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like you, you, you dip into both worlds. Like, I love a Louis Vuitton bag. Do not get me wrong, but yeah, you'll yeah. see a little crystal in that bag usually. So yeah. I'm a bit of um, a bit of everything. But I used to work in fashion. I think that's why I just love a bit of fashion still. That hasn't gone anywhere. That's probably just got even more. But um, yeah, I don't know. I wish I knew, but I love it. I just love it all. Yeah. And do you do, do you like dip into your crystals? Do you do that kind of thing as a regular thing or just when you're, I don't know, going through something or a little bit more stressed or a little bit more anxious, do you turn to it then? Like what's your, cause I, I'm not at all. Like it's something I've always been really curious and interested in, but maybe I'm lazy. Just have No, you're like, not. I mean, gone as I sit here, like as I sit in front of you, I've got a ginormous crystal oh, cave yeah, like lovely. right here. And I keep looking over to the side cause there's about eight crystals over there. I've got one beside my bed. So they're always around me. If I'm nervous, I'll travel with one. So if I'm nervous about like podcast guests that are really like, you know, I don't know, people that I'm scared to interview, which is really common, I'll have my crystal with me. Mm. Um, And I use angel cards. So if I'm feeling a little bit like I need a bit of a compass, Mm. totally I'll read my cards. But since I've had a therapist, I think I lean more into him for that kind of like really solid support and then I move into like the hippie stuff around the moons usually so new moon and full moon so new moon you're meant to set new intentions then Mm. full moon you're meant to let go of the junk that's not serving you so I usually tap in around those times but other than that I I just they're pretty yeah and I have them around me and I've got special ones though that 
like I've got Labrador right under my bed and that's because it's the crystal that makes dreams come through. And that was a really um, special gift that I was given like 20 years ago, you oh, know, wow. so there's some stuff I that really, that's still really important to me. Yeah, and I do love that. Like I, like as I say, I've never really delved into that stuff, but when I was sort of related, a bit of a tangent, but when I was doing the oral for my PhD, I was like super anxious and super nervous. So I went to see a hypnotherapist for it. Yeah. And it, and I don't even know that she did a particularly great job. Just in that, like I don't think that I was that much changed other than at the end of it, I was like, cool, I've dealt with that now. I've put, I've figured out where my anxiety comes from. I can label it and put it in a little box and just leave it over there and then go and do my oral and not have to worry about the thing that was stressing me out. So I feel like, when, so when I think about crystals and I think about things related to the moon, like when I think about the moon and think, oh, I had a rubbish sleep. Oh, it's a full moon. Oh, that'll explain it. Not that I know why that it will explain it, but I have just heard that before. So I almost explain something away because of, these other things rather than I don't know no I like that and I love that you just mentioned hypnotherapy I get hypnotherapy too my therapist does hypnotherapy and I oh wow I totally understand the experience you just described because sometimes we'll work on something through hypno or through visualization and I'm like oh what's this going to achieve and by the end of the session I'm like oh that's dealt with to the point that I've been acting because some acting classes use um I love my acting training, but some of it is uses trauma, which mm. I don't I don't agree with. And and I got asked to bring up some really heavy trauma in an acting class, and I just looked straight down the barrel, and I was just like, "I'll tell you whatever you need to hear, but it's not mm. going to have an impact on me because I've processed it and worked on it." And my, and I told my therapist after I was like, "They wanted me to cry. I couldn't cry." <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, because you've done all the healing on it. Yeah, He's yeah. like, "It'll never work for you in a traumatic." environment ever again yeah and and so yeah very 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 interesting very interesting yeah it means that you're going to have to use another tool to get those kind of tears on demand oh yeah, there's way better ways I don't believe yeah. in I don't believe in trauma work at all mm. uh, in, in acting because it's not therapeutic and that's not a safe environment personally yeah, I know, but I, I love that you can increase your breath and that makes you, you like you'll you'll be up here and therefore when you're increasing your breath and your heart rate's lifted and your pulse is going a bit more, it's easy to feel emotion. Like I love those oh, kind yeah. of hats because that's that's physiological. Like yeah. that's something that you can literally turn on and off and there's not a psychological cost on you at all. I love the science of human behaviour so much. Do you know what? That's so interesting because, of course, when I talk to clients and students about the power of breath, I'm always coming at it from the other side. Like, okay, because, you know, when you get really anxious, your shoulders come up around here and you start breathing in here and, of course, you get that cortisol response. And so I never think about it from a, you know, and you can use that and engineer that to your advantage, of course. It's so fascinating. I yeah, like yeah. there's one acting teacher I just loved and there was a scene I was auditing him so I was just watching him but he was working with an actor and this actor had to go from irate anger to bawling his eyes out. Mm. And the director just goes just just quicken your breath mate it'll come. And I just watched him like he just was did the irate anger and he, and the director's like quicken the breath quicken the breath and he just was like sad to almost not hyperventilate but quicken his breath the shoulders came up just like you said. Here's game. Amazing. How cool is that? That, that is gets cool. me excited about acting. I'm like, I love that the power of the human behavior. Human behavior is freaking amazing. It is, eh? And I heard you talk on a podcast. I can't remember which one it was. I'm sorry, but um, about the hot or the ice bath. So you yeah. having your ice bath experience and kind of using Wim Hof breathing to help calm you down, relax. And you said Matt was he was just super calm and chilled because he uses breath all the time. Where you were like. Yeah. <gasps> And then, yeah, you know, yeah, that stuff excites me, like things, you know, because you're in health and, and I love health stuff as well, but just how environments can change how you feel and and putting yourself in uncomfortable situations allows you to grow and, and develop. And I know that's almost tangenting from the ice bath, but sort of similar because you need to adapt and become resilient and then, you know, go on. Oh, totally, totally. And I think the trick to acting, and I didn't expect to talk so much about acting, but I love it, mm. is resilience mm. and, and, and life experience because you've got to show up and be a human and you've got to show these human experiences. And yeah. so the more that you have an understanding of your own psychology, the more that you're resilient, the better you're going to be able to show up and be like, 
I know what that feeling is. I know what that looks like. Uh, or I can sympathize with the character I'm playing right now because yeah. I understand my own psychology. It's so cool. Yeah. And Lola, I think, you know, it is all related because you're every day you're putting yourself out there in that public space. And I have to say, when you and Matt got together like two and a half years ago, I think that probably everyone that followed you was like, oh, this guy, he seems really nice. He seems like he's the type of guy that could ground you. Not that you, not that you seemed like you needed grounding, but you know, you just had, you had almost a sense of calm around him. And I've got to say that I, I think probably everyone who saw that and see how happy you are now just probably just feels that really warm feeling that I'm feeling thinking about it. Like, it's so lovely. Yeah, he's a good egg. Um, Bosso, I call him. He's yeah. a great He's a great human. But he is that, like I even described it to my best friend the other day. I was like, it's not that love, like that teenage love where you're like, oh, oh my God, I'm lost and all that. It's like a teammate. It's super solid. Yeah. It's like there's a sense of ease. It's completely different to I think what as a like young 20 year old you fantasize about and you're like I'm gonna meet my like Matt and I are watching Gossip Girl at the moment I'm gonna meet my Chuck Bass or I'm yes. gonna meet my Nate Archibald like you know I'm talking about characters out of a, an yeah, amazing yeah. tv show by the way um it's not that it's this sense of like I remember our first date with men on a dating app and I sat next to him and I was like oh, I can be myself around this person and I feel safe to do that. Mm. And that was the feeling I got. And the feeling that he got was, oh, she's going to be in my life. Like he just got that straight away. And and so I just, I I like explaining that because I think that people think, and and I remember when I was younger in my 20s, I was like, I need my Prince Charming to ride in on a white horse and rescue me Mm. and da-da-da. And those people don't really exist and, and I spent a good to- solid 10 years dating absolute I used to call them lessons but really like quite narcissistic people because I had my own issues going on and so I was bringing in really full-on heartbreak kind of lessons but yeah when I met Matt it was just such a sense of like we're a team very mm. different to what I to what I expected and I think I was probably different to what he expected as well like he'd been he'd always dated those real dramery kind of girls like a um, Serena Vanderwoods, and if yeah, anyone yeah. has watched, um, Gossip Girl. watched Gossip Girl, to have all the Gossip Girl re- re- referral. But yeah, I just think it's more of a, it's like a, they, I read a book by Osho and it was um, a cool love. It's like this like teammate, there's this yes. calm love, you know what I mean? That's yeah, what it yeah. is. Yeah, it's, and you've got to be in the right space for that as well, right? Like, yeah. not that it's about me, but when me and my husband met, we, um, we met like three years earlier and dated for about eight weeks and then I called it off. Nothing to do with him. It was all to do with me. And then when we kind of reconnected, then it just was exactly that, like, oh, yeah, this is right. And there was no real reason why it would have been any different, but yeah. I had changed, things had changed, and you just kind of were in that right space. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. And- Big time. Got to yeah. grow. Yeah. And Lola, the other guy that you, I see all the time on your Insta feed and I absolutely love it's your dad. Oh, yeah. Are you a dad's girl? Like, is that, in the yeah. not, I see your mum as well, but you know, like you stay yeah. with your dad. And... Yeah, 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 yeah. So dad and I are tight as, we're so close. He, uh, he's, I just interviewed him for my podcast. I'm oh, so excited. Great. Um, yeah, we've got a great relationship. So I have a very gypsy life. Like I'll travel. I've lived in Sydney. I've, I'll go for like you know three, four months stints in America, London. Like I just and he's like, just use this is your home base. Nice. And so I've always had this amazing home base that is dad's. And I'll go to Sydney and live for five years and then come back and be like, sup? I'm back. Until I remember I'd lived in Sydney for yeah five years. And I'd book this work gig in the Maldives of all places. But I had a six-week window between going, like, my rent ending in Sydney and going to Maldives. And he's like, yeah, just move in for six weeks, no probs. Awesome. You know, like, it's just been, he's always said, you know, there's a roof over your head here. And I've probably taken total advantage of that. Like, sometimes I come for a week and sometimes I come for a few months. Yeah, yeah. So we've, and even in my 30s, like, I've spent months on end with Dad and he's just, been amazing so no he's he, he, if you said like I don't really believe in feeling proud about what I do but I do want my dad to feel proud about what I do like I, he's really important 
to me and he like I often will say to Matt I'm like speaking up to my dad that'd rock that'd be that's that'll be the heart like I always go that'll be the hardest thing I ever have to go through because yeah. my dad is my number one yeah you know yeah and it's you can nice. see it and I yeah no oh, absolutely and I love my mom. I got to make a sense note about my mom. She's cheeky as anything. She's a one. She's my cheerleader. She's that person the day the book's on sale, even though I've sent her, a, you know, advanced copy. Yeah, she'll yeah. go out and buy twenty copies for her <laughs> mates, get them all signed. My mom has taught me to march to the beat of your own drum, nice. and that's a gift that she's given me. And she's really sassy. I and. I look so much like even Matt's like, oh, you're doing your mum's laugh. Oh, you look like it. Like I like my, I've got a lot that's come from my mum. But even though like my my dad's got a very gentle heart, and mm. I think deep down I've got quite a gentle heart, and that's why we get on so 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 well. But yeah, my mum's got a wicked sense of humour, and she's got pet sheep now that she's named <laughs> the weirdest names, and yeah, she's just funny, very funny. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, Lola. And um, <laughs> so. Just a couple of questions. One, in 2015, you didn't like coffee and now you own a coffee company and you can't get through your day without it. So what happened there? When did you see the light, basically? Mickey, I've just done four days, no coffee. It's so hard. Mate, <laughs> are you looking forward to your like, cup of lumber? Tomorrow morning, I am on coffee. Um, I just, because I'd just been at Gaia Retreat and I thought there's all this amazing food. This is the perfect place because I intermittent fast. Yes. And and I knew I wouldn't be intermittent fasting at the retreat because the food's so delicious. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, this is the perfect place to just go off coffee for a few days because mm. I own a coffee company. I consume it without fail every single day and I love it. Mm. And it hasn't made me fall out of love with coffee at all. But um, I just had never had a coffee like in my adult life and my business partner's at Happy Place. Oh, and, like he's really big in coffee in Melbourne. And we were in a meeting one afternoon. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I've never had a coffee. And he's like, he's Italian. And his, his like mouth just dropped and he was like, <laughs> what? Mm. And I was like, yeah, I've had a coffee. And he was like, that like that had made me a coffee. And then because they owned a beautiful coffee shop they'd always hook me up with coffee and I have my own little French press and so I love I love a beautiful black I'm a black coffee drinker sometimes I'll have an oat latte if I feel like but my body like if I'm being honest about like what reacts with me and not like when I have paleo no grain and not even oat I feel fantastic so yeah. just a good black coffee or like I love the I have Lola coffee every single day as well but yeah so that's how I was in a meeting and I was force fed it. <laughs> no, it's not yet available in New Zealand because I have tried like multiple times and, and I haven't quite got myself an Aussie contact to be able to like get me some. But it's got um, lion's mane in it too, right? Medicinal mushrooms. Correct. So it's awesome. good for focus. And I yes. will send you a box after this interview. So there's your Aussie contact. Mate, no, you do not have to do that. Yeah, I sure will. How I sure lovely. Will. How lovely. <laughs> um, Lola, who has, like, over the years, who have, who's really mentored you, like, in terms of maybe the stuff around the nutrition and health space, the business space? Yeah, who's been really that kind of, like, guiding voice? Oh, you're going to laugh. So I've never had a mentor, a business mentor before. Mm. I think now my therapist, like, I pitch, take all my business pitches straight to him. <laughs> and he's like, Brilliant. especially with if I'm, if I'm going in fighting for a percentage and I get a bit like, not good with my self-worth he's like you need to you know go in and see so he helps me before I do any negotiating with any of my business staff nice um but as far as like mentors I remember every time I do tv because tv is like my full passion I had three things that I'd watch for inspiration and it was because I love their energy and it comes down you've brought up like authenticity a few times and it comes down because they're so real yeah uh, you gotta laugh at this combo so I would always watch Steve Irwin Oh, yes, you've talked about him a lot. Awesome. Unapologetically himself. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Jamie Oliver. The thing that I learned off Jamie Oliver that I love and I to this day do it, if he stuffs up, he just keeps going. He's like, can you just chop the garlic? Oh, fuck. I mean, I mean, I mean onion and he just yeah. keeps rolling. I yeah. love that. Uh, and then I would always watch Jack Sparrow off Pirates of the Caribbean, oh, which is Johnny Depp. <laughs> He's so quirky and, yeah. and himself and eccentric and I like that being celebrated like I like realness being celebrated and and so that was like my little matrix and 
then I would often, if I wanted to deep dive Jamie Oliver, I'd watch him with Gennaro, who's like the Italian yes. godfather. Yeah, and I've yeah. interviewed her, him in real life. And so I kind of felt like a little connection to him. But okay. um, they're kind of my three that I've always watched from the outside. But as far as like career mentors, like now what I do, because I want to work as a TV host, I'll look at my favourite ones. So I'll look at like um, Jimmy Fallon. I still look at Ricky Gervais because I think he's just incredibly intelligent. Um, is it Steve Colbert? Steve Colbert is another um, big American um, host. They're all males, of course, I yeah. guess. <laughs> but I think that maybe that yang energy I love. Yeah, that's awesome, Lola. And so what does 2021 hold for you? I mean, we talked about your book. It's coming out in September. You mentioned the trip to America. Do you know how that's going to pan out, where you're heading, what you're doing there yet, or is that still under wraps? Well, in Australia, if you leave the country right now, they kick you out. Mm. So um, I, have to, I have to leave yeah. for a while. Um, so I have to head out for a couple of months or stay at Lalo in America. If it feels yuck, I'll go to Hawaii. Um, I love Hawaii. Me too. It's amazing. I just don't really feel like flying internally in America though at the moment. But um, Hawaii or Palm Springs, just kind of like lay low there. Yeah. Um, and just uh, pe- a lot of people are saying it might be a little bit more functional come May, in which yeah. case, you know, I'd try and take acting class. I'd try yeah. to do some pod stuff as well while I'm activating the green card it takes a, a couple of months to activate properly and to get your little card uh and then I'd come back do the book tour in Australia and then like this time next year hopefully take it to America because um I'll end up once I've got my green card I have based myself 50 50 so 50 percent in Byron Bay 50 percent Los Angeles that sounds amazing Lola yeah I could talk to you all day. Oh, it's just because, you know, same page, health, yeah. pe- you know, passionate about it, funny, you know, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. And, and right now as well, I am multitasking because I'm in like a sauna-based studio quite clearly and podcasting at the same time. So it's like taking things to the nth degree. What I will say, Lola, is if you get an opportunity and you go to Maui and you're like, who should I interview? Someone left field, fast over 40. I don't know if you've heard of... Cynthia Montaloni. No. She's like, no. She's basically a carnivore, um, 400 meter world champion sprinter. And, but she's got an amazing soul, an amazing heart. So I don't know if you're into it. Wow. I know that's actually yeah. very different from almost a lot of people that like you in, you interview lots of like Australian stars, your acting coaches. The, it's completely yeah, different. No, I like anyone. I like anyone that's like marching to the beat of their own drum, you know, like. That's all that matters to me, you know. I Yeah, I, I could talk to anyone. Yeah, I can see that as well. You would love her. Um, I love how real you are. I love that you're into drinking martinis, even if it's just, I mean, the, it's one, but I yeah. do love that. Um, yeah, um, I love it. I love a dry gin martini. Yeah. So you say gin. Is a martini not often gin? I mean, I wouldn't know. Usually, yeah, so it's vodka. Okay. You, so, but I think gin is like, from what I can understand from watching Gossip Girl, <laughs> yeah. um, I think gin is like the luck. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. If, if you're a real martini drinker, you have a gin martini. Oh, there you go. Apparently. But I don't know why. And, and I like when they put a little twist of lemon in yeah, it. Yeah, nice. It's really nice. But, yeah, I just have I, – I don't go – that's why I love them. They're clean. I don't go overboard. You know, I feel like flirty and then I – That's it, right? Know. And I think that's you. You've got this, such a lovely sense of balance and it really comes through. Um, final question, Lola. What's your favourite food? Oh, uh, okay, okay. Or, or wow. meal. Or meal. Well, Matt makes amazing um, Mexican fish tacos. Oh, They're amazing. But I'm a sweet tooth yeah. through and through. So at Gaia they do these muffins. They have different flavours every single day and they are dairy-free, gluten-free and sugar-free, mm-hmm. but they're delicious. And they do this like there was this banana chocolate ricotta one mm. that was insane. That sounds delicious. I'll say that. That sounds lovely. Mm. Lola Berry, lovely. thank you for your time this afternoon. It's been lovely to talk to you. And podcasting is such a selfish thing because basically it's like, okay, who do I really want to talk to? But a little bit scared yeah. about that. I've got a reason to reach out. And you were just so gracious to say, yeah, sweet as I'll come on. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, honoured, Mickey. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. Alright, 
team. So if you have yet to tune into Lola's podcast, I highly recommend it. And I absolutely love her Friday Byron Bay Diaries. I'm a big fan of Australia. So go and check out her podcast in addition to her Instagram page at Lola Berry, where she just shares everything about kind of life and, and what she's up to over in Byron Bay. Order your Lola Coffee from lolacoffee.co. And I've also popped a link to Lola's books up on the show notes as well this week. Now next week, we take a little bit of a pivot to one of my other favorite topics, all about health and the science of metabolic health. I get to sit down and chat to Dr. Ben Bickman, who if anyone has any interest in insulin resistance, you would no doubt have heard of Ben Bickman and his work. We talk all about insulin resistance and cardiometabolic health. I think for those of you who have interest in this space, you'll really find this a fascinating discussion. Until then, peeps, you can find me over on Twitter and Instagram at Mickey Willardin, where I share what I do day to day and the research that I've been looking up over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition or jump onto my website where you can sign up to my weekly email where I do a deep dive into a topic that I'm interested in and share some great recipes or sign up to one of my meal plans. That's a really good way to support the podcast and get the opportunity to pick my brain on anything nutrition. Join our Mickey Willardin Real Food community, which is just a hive of activity and recipes and all that good stuff. Or jump on and book a consultation with me for some individual one-on-one nutrition advice. All right, team, until next week, have a fab week.